Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Eric. How are you? Morning, Adam. Good. How are you? Great. How's things on the West Coast? Good? It's all good. East Coast, uh, we're having nice weather as well. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we've got a, uh, a cast of two here today uh, with uh, both uh, Max and uh, Bailey uh, joining us. It's a rare occasion when they're both here. And who knows, maybe Cooper will come and visit. Uh, Chloe uh, likes to stay by herself upstairs, so... She, she won't she'll be a no-show eric uh did you say you got a dog recently yeah i got a little corgi puppy who is rummaging around all right well, um, he's very cute he'll make an appearance soon if he'll make an appearance that's great uh and uh you know one of these days we'll bring all of the audience in live and they can show their puppies as well maybe we'll have a puppy day uh that that, that would be fun so certainly would be a distraction from uh some of the uh uh, insanities and turmoils that we've seen in the markets here, especially in the past week. And of course, uh, even more turmoil on the geopolitical front. Uh, I, uh, I'm i quite concerned about uh, what's going on in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the war between Ukraine and Russia are getting worse. And so I think uh, yeah, the markets basically ignored geopolitical risk. But uh, uh, at least uh, from my vantage point, uh, it's something that uh, needs to to be considered. It's uh, one of the reasons we've been recommending overweighting energy in portfolios. You know, we've been recommending for a while, really since the beginning of the bull market, overweighting technology and industrials, financials, and energy. And uh, three out of four ain't bad. Uh, the three have done well and energy hasn't done well, but it doesn't, doesn't take much these days to overweight energy. It's such a small uh, market cap in the S&P 500, but uh, we would uh, continue to recommend doing so. And uh, uh, maybe even uh, gold. Uh, I'm not a, never really been much uh, of a of a gold bug. Uh, I've always focused on assets that have a return, uh, interest, uh, dividends, uh, rent. Uh, but uh, gold does well during periods of geopolitical uh, stress. And uh, we, we may have a situation like that now with uh, concerns about uh, Iran attacking Israel. And then where, where does it go from there? And then, uh, you know, we'll see how Putin uh, responds to uh, being attacked uh, on, the, on the motherland by uh, by the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians uh, certainly uh, know where to send their drones. They send them to their to the oil and gas facilities of, of Russia. So it's something that bears, uh, bears watching. But uh, in uh, this morning's uh, morning briefing, uh, we focus on good news, not bad news. The good news is uh, is, is on earnings. And uh, that's what we're going to discuss. And then uh, I'll do that. And then Eric uh, will pick up on uh, the uh, inverted yield curve and uh, why we're not concerned. You know, people were concerned when the yield curve was inverting. And now they're con concerned because it's disinverting uh, because they look at the charts and say, oh, my God, every time the yield curve is disinverted, we've uh, had a recession. So Eric will ad address uh, that issue in a minute. Let me just uh, breeze through. Uh, the um, story we have for you on uh, on earnings. Uh, so um, we can look at um, the first chart here. It tells shows you S and P five hundred operating earnings per, per share. Let me just hang up on whoever this is. Uh, annoying call. Okay, there we go. I'm back. Uh, so we've got uh, operating earnings uh, using the IBES uh, data going to an all-time record high during the the second quarter. Uh, so that's uh, pretty impressive. I think we have something like uh, Joe Abbott, uh, our colleague, reports that 90% or more of the S&P 500 have reported. So uh, that's a, that's that's going to be a pretty good uh, a number there that, that, that we're showing. Record high in earnings, certainly no no recession there. Uh, that's not to say that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, record highs have always preceded recessions. The question is, by how much. So the, just because it's a record high doesn't mean that there isn't uh, a recession right immediately ahead. Uh, but it certainly suggests that the economy is still doing well. And uh, our view is uh, profitable companies uh, tend to hire people and unprofitable companies tend to fire people. And uh, if they're profitable, they should be hiring as long as there isn't some uh, recession out, he uh, out here that, that was anticipated by the inverted yield curve or now the disinverted yield curve. Uh, just to hammer home that uh, Eric's about to discuss that issue. 
Uh, so uh, things look pretty good. Uh, we've got uh, earnings year over year percent change, uh, almost 11% uh, coming into the earnings season. Uh, analysts really hadn't uh, whacked their estimates as, as much as they typically do going into an earnings season. Uh, and instead, they were looking for an 8% increase. So they're really not that far off. Um, and as you can see, uh, relative to uh, the average over time, that's a, a, a pretty good um, uh, reading. Uh, looking ahead, we, we, we continue to see uh, well, the analysts are looking for double-digit increases over the next couple of years, and uh, we, don't we don't really disagree with that. Uh, again, no recession uh, in our view. Uh, analysts don't do a very good job of anticipating recessions, so uh, we can't go by, by their projections, but uh, that's my job, that's your job. We, we have to assess in our portfolio management uh, what the likelihood is of a recession because bear markets occur in recessions. Uh, so here's the um, quarterly uh, numbers. We update them every single week. And it, you can see we've had uh, another one of these earnings hooks. We've shown you many times in the past that coming into earnings seasons, analysts cut back uh, their estimates. And then, oh, my goodness, it turns out to be better than they expected. I, I think that's partly because the uh, companies that are going to give us negative surprises uh, uh, kind of tip off the analysts, tip off the investment community, that they're not doing too well, and they do that before the earnings season. Um, whereas companies that uh, are going to give us positive surprises like to uh, keep it uh, quiet until the earnings season, and then um, you know uh, investors are very happy to see that they've done better than was expected. Interestingly, though, uh, the bad news is the third quarter estimates have been coming down uh, since uh, as these have been going up. So that suggests that there has been some uh, negative guidance here. Uh, but again, it may very well be setting us up for the next earnings hook for the third quarter and even the fourth quarter, which is what we expect. Uh, but when we look at this, uh, so here's the growth rates again um, for the various quarters. Uh, but uh, when we look at uh, the annual numbers, adding up the four quarters, so we have the first quarter, we have the second quarter as actual numbers, and we still have third and fourth quarters as estimated numbers. Uh, you can see that the annual numbers don't look too bad, that 2024 is held up uh, relatively uh, steady, uh, well above uh, 2023. 2025, uh, same thing, hold, it's holding up uh, well above 2024. These are double digit increases, as is the increase from 25 to 26. Uh, so, uh, you know, we uh, like to focus on forward earnings, time weighted average of analyst expectations for this year and next year. And as you can see, uh, the uh, forward earnings is at an all time record high. And uh, we view that as being fundamentally bullish, literally fundamentally bullish, um, uh, as long as there's no recession up ahead here. And that's that's our forecast. We're still in the uh, no landing, soft landing camp. There, there are people out there still hanging on there with the recession. We finally call them die hard, hard landers, no hard feelings. We, uh, we, we, we feel their pain. And at some point, uh, we may be in pain. <laughs> If we fall into a recession that we're not expecting and they can claim uh, that they were right after all several years after they started anticipating a recession. Uh, but let me not uh, go along the, that line anymore. Let's look at the, these lines, which shows uh, forward earnings uh, pushed ahead by 12 months relative to uh, for, uh, this relative to uh, the actual earnings uh, on a four quarter sum basis. And you can see it does a pretty good job of anticipating actual earnings with the exception of recessions. They don't see recessions coming. And again, that's uh, that's our job. So uh, the happy news here is uh, forward earnings uh, is really kind of a coincident indicator. It's a pretty uh, closely correlated with the index of coincident economic indicators. And it's leading in the sense of that we have it on a weekly basis. So on a weekly basis, uh, we get a, a fairly useful index of coincident economic indicators uh, called the forward earnings. Um, when you look at the forward earnings relative to one of the components of the CEI, uh, the, you'll see that one of the components is payroll employment, uh, uh, non-farm payroll employment. And again, the correlation is pretty good. It's uh, quite coincident. Uh, and uh, this gets back to our simple rule of thumb that profitable companies and to expand, they hire, they expand their capacity, and profitable companies go the other way. Uh, so how do we get uh, record revenues here, uh, record earnings? Uh, 
Uh, well, revenues have done pretty well. Uh, as you can see, they're up uh, almost uh, 6%. That's uh, above the average over time of 4.4%. This is kind of what the earnings typically do when we're not in a re recession on, on average. Um, and um, actually, earnings should do better than that because this is an average over time, including the, uh, the recessionary uh, periods. So uh, here's a chart putting the revenues, uh, actual revenues, not forward, actual revenues together with operating earnings. Uh, you can uh, stare at this chart when you have some time, and you can see that the scales are identical, except for this uh, This scale is uh, this scale times 10. Uh, so it's basically um, indexed for a multiple of 10 uh, between earnings and uh, uh, between re revenues and, and earnings. And as you can see, we have uh, S&P 500 operating earnings uh, at a record high. Uh, revenues are back to their record high of a couple of quarters ago, so they're not at a record high. Uh, but uh, we would expect that they will continue to grow around 4%, uh, particularly as inflation continues to, uh, to moderate. So from those two numbers, we can get the profit margin. Profit margin ticked up uh, to 12.3%. Uh, Nothing wrong with that. Uh, and uh, this, uh, you can see, is our calculation of forward profit margin using forward earnings divided by forward revenues. And again, you can see that that's a pretty good correlation, and it's an optimistic one currently saying that this is uh, likely to go still higher. And indeed, uh, we think the profit margin over the next couple of years could actually be going to a new record high. Um, we're going to do more and more work on that because we get some pushback that, you know, well, interest expense is going to go up. Uh, and uh, some other factors may uh, squeeze profit margins, uh, particularly, I, I suppose, if we get uh, President uh, Harris, uh, there might be more uh, corporate taxes. So uh, it's a fluid situation right now. But our story is that um, if things don't change too much on the uh, tax side, uh, we think that the productivity situation is going to uh, be the uh, driver of profit margins, and it'll be a very... A, a positive driver. Uh, Eric, you want to take over here? Um, are you able to uh, control this the thing? I, I guess I, I I could figure out some way to share it, but I'll I'll just uh, I'll slide it along for you, so you don't have to be bothered. Why don't you start out with uh, so the, the Eric? What's the story here? Uh, everybody's looking at the uh, at this chart, and uh, they're looking at uh, the inverted yield curve. This in, in this case, we're using the ten year minus Fed. Fed funds rate, we can use the 10-year minus the two-year. Uh, but they are they don't have on their chart, they don't have these red lines. So pretend you're looking at this chart without the red lines. And it sure looks like, you know, when the yield curve starts to disinvert, you, you fall into recession. It happened here. It happened here. It happened here. So why why shouldn't we worry about that? The yield curve is disinverting. Oh, my God, we're going to get a recession. Take it away, Eric. Yeah. So, um as I'm sure a lot of you know, the 10 year, two year chart, it's uh, kind of flirting with uninverting or disinverting and uh, normalizing. And historically, what we've seen is, you know, the when does the yield curve uh, invert? The Fed jacks up short term rates, usually to tackle inflation. And then investors buy long term bonds because they think, you know, over this horizon, short term rates um, are going to average less than this. And uh, usually what they're expecting is, there will be, you know, higher rates will cause a credit crisis somewhere. And then um, the Fed will, you know, rush in to cut short term rates to stem a recession. My dog is jumping around um, to stem a recession. And then uh, the yield curve will kind of snap back. And that's why you see it snap back um, ahead of recessions. But that's not a recession indicator. It's just kind of what the Fed does in response to a crisis. So without a crisis, um, we don't see a recession on the horizon that's at least born from um, Fed tightening itself. I think it's interesting you see on this chart, the mini banking crisis in March of last year, the 210 curve inverted to like minus 107 bips right after that. Uh, within a week, once the Fed stepped in um, with their BTFP, their bank term funding program, and the Treasury and FDIC basically de you know, insured depositors, uh, it snapped back to like minus 40 bips so, um, you know, what, what the Treasury yield curve is showing is, is there a credit crisis coming? Uh, not this is a recession um, that's going to come in six to 12 months. It's not a predictor necessarily. 
Uh, I think we can go to the next chart, Ed. And so the whole like long and variable lags argument, I think, um, you know, what it misses is this credit crisis cycle. And you can see this is the senior loan officer uh, survey, the sluice, and, um, you know, rates haven't come down and yet we're already easing uh, lending conditions or we're not tightening them as much. Um, when I was in the New York Fed's desk, we ran this in the SPUCE, uh, the financial officer survey. And then we spoke with the banks, um, you know, to get their thoughts. And they always said, you know, these are pretty conservative estimates. Um, they also move at kind of like a step stone pace. So they'll go from tightening considerably to tightening somewhat, to leaving unchanged, to then easing somewhat, to then easing considerably. Uh, this is like soft data you're giving to the Fed. You know, you're going to be pretty like tame with what you're telling them. Um, and I think this chart's a great example of, uh, you know, banks have been lending all along um, throughout this entire cycle, whether they've been reporting, you know, there's been tighter standards to some degree, but um, by and large, borrowers who need financing are getting it. And this is just from banks. Um, we've been writing about private credit. The the boon and dry, and dry powder in private credit is has been great for, you know, people who tap the high yield and level loan markets. Um, and they get kind of more bespoke covenants uh, and terms. So um, I don't, you know, the whole long and variable lag thing, I think, is disproven by this chart, by that chart right there. Um, and then this is, uh, you know, I, I guess you can call it risk, um, equity volatility and credit spreads. The VIX blew out on Monday um, amidst all the turmoil. Um, we think a lot of that had to do with all the short vol positions, which are basically a carry trade. Um which is, you know, they got hit by the steamroller as they were collecting their pennies. Um, but credit spreads barely budged. You know, I think they hit like 377 bips over treasuries. Um, they're back down to around 350. In like a recession or a crisis or any kind of worries, uh, especially with rates at these levels, you'd expect like six, 700 bips at least on uh, high yield OAS. So, you know, kind of no, no recession indicator from the credit market. Um, and then, yeah, so I think an interesting kind of part of the inverted curve is the fact that the Fed is doing QT right now, which should like relieve pressure off the long end of the curve and, and let those rates float higher. Um, the reason or a couple of reasons why that's not happening is, first of all, the Treasury has been concentrating a bulk of its issuance in bills uh, and shorter term ish and, sh and like shorter term treasuries. And all the stuff rolling off the Fed's balance sheet is naturally like shorter term. Uh, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year debt. I don't know if they own 20 year, but uh, 10 and 30 year debt takes a while to roll off. So the stock of duration that the market needs to absorb is like not increasing all that much. Um, so you're really not getting too much QT impact on the yield curve. And then if we go down a couple charts, we can see that like what it, what is QT really done? Uh, and the answer is not much. Reserve balances, these are effectively the same series. Um, I think he has the zoomies. Um, these are effectively the same series, but reserve balances are around $3.4 trillion. That's above where they were um, when we were coming out of, when we were in the midst of the pandemic. The, you know, QT has largely been funded by the reverse repo facility, uh, which hit like a peak of $2.2 trillion and then 2.5 um, around the end of the year in 2022. So it's basically just money market fund cash funding all the bills that the treasury is issuing. Um, the whole idea of QE is to suck duration out of the market. Um, QT is supposed to push duration risk back into the market. But if you're just issuing bills to money market funds, uh, QT is not really doing too much. So um, it's kind of an interesting dynamic in terms of the tightness of financial conditions. Yeah, I guess you have to work at the Federal Reserve Bank uh, trading desk to, uh, to know all that. But we we'll appreciate that. Uh, Eric, awesome. Eric, thanks. Why don't, uh, we've uh, we've covered things so so well here that there isn't one single question on the Q and A. So if anybody wants to jump in, uh, we'd be uh, more than happy to, uh, to to take your questions. Uh, Eric, uh, you're you're working on on what for tomorrow? You're doing some work on uh, uh, the credit cards. Yeah, consumer credit. Um, much ado about the whole transitions into delinquency. Um, it kind of misses two things. First of all, like a transition into delinquency is just a transition over the past year. You're kind of missing people who catch up on their borrowing. Um, 
And also like as a percent of disposable income, borrowing has been falling uh, for several years, much below the, the pandemic. So I think consumer credit looks looks fine by and large. Um, you know, credit cards aren't a huge percentage of borrowing. It's like six, 7%. Uh, mortgages are like 70% and delinquencies on mortgages have cratered. So um, yeah, no, I think the, the consumer looks all right in terms of borrowing balance sheets are pretty healthy. Both corporate yeah. and, and household balance sheets, to be honest. Yeah, you know, the, the pushback is uh, during the earnings season, a lot of consumer-related companies were, were saying that consumers are being more careful or a little bit more stressed. And some of them were saying that in order to uh, keep the consumer, they had to lower their prices, which we don't really have a problem with. Companies are going to lower their prices to keep the consumer spending. Uh, that's uh, that, that's a pretty good scenario. We, uh, Eric, we got some oh, questions, questions here. Yeah. Uh, what do you expect from this week's PPI and CPI inflation data? Uh, Eric, you're also working on that. Uh, so yeah. Let's so um, CPI, so we might actually in the next month or two um, – get a little bit less progress on, you know, like moderating inflation, quote unquote. Um, this is something the Fed is definitely mindful of the base effects from last year. So if you guys recall, um, in the second half of 2023, we had a lot of really soft monthly prints, especially ex excluding shelter. Um, we're coming up on those compares now. So um, we might get like a 0 0.2, 0 0.25 monthly increase in CPI. Um, we'll start to get a bigger spread between core and headline CPI. Um, but by and large, I think the the message is, you know, we're on track for a 25 basis point cut in September, a substantially hot print um, or a substantially cool print, I think, keeps them on track. And then we'll hear more at Jackson Hole um, in a week or two here. And then for PPI, um, you know, China has been exporting deflation. That's been great for PPI goods prices. Um, Chinese PPI deflated again last month, 0.8 percent. Um so, yeah, I think, you know, it's rising a little bit, but we expect that to settle around 2.5%. A lot of geopolitical risks there, of course. Um, freight costs, especially from Asia, rising with the Houthis um, kind of controlling the Red Sea or the Suez Canal. Um, there's other geopolitical risks. But for now, PPI looks pretty benign. Another one for you, Eric. Uh, do you believe in further curve steepening? Uh, yeah. I mean, the Fed is going to cut rates. I think if they cut 25 bips in September... Um, you know, we should see the curve uninvert or disinvert uh, without a recession or a credit crisis. Um, you know, just as the inverted curve didn't precede a recession, I don't think the uninverting curve will this time around, all else equal. Yeah. Um, okay. Gus is asking, uh, Ed, we are seeing inc uh, increases in unemployment from additions to the supply of workers. At what point, if any, would you have concern? Uh, yeah, Eric and I have been doing a lot of work on that. Uh, been writing about it, uh, been sort of uh, pushing back on the so-called SOM rule, which uh, has been saying that uh, as the unemployment rate goes up uh, relative to um, its three-month uh, average low or 12, over the past 12 months, uh, that uh, it's, you know, unemployment goes up a little, uh, slowly, then all of a sudden it spikes up. And uh, that, that's part of our credit uh, crisis uh, cycle theory, is that if you don't get a credit crisis uh, uh, as a result of tightening monetary policy, which we admit historically you almost always have, but maybe this time it's different. And I uh, hope that, that wasn't a jinx, Eric, but uh, so far it has been different. And if that's the case, then we're not going to get that spike in unemployment because we're not going to get a recession caused by, you know, financial crisis leading to a credit crunch leading to a recession. Uh, so uh, that's our position on it. And so if the unemployment rate's going up because uh, people want to work, more people want to work, and some, some of them are immigrants, legal and illegal, um, that shouldn't be uh, an issue with regards to uh, creating a, um, that wouldn't be a signaling a recession, obviously. So uh, to answer your question, we'd be looking at the components of unemployment. We'd be looking for uh, uh, the, you know, the unemployment that's actually caused by people losing their jobs. Uh, we're watching the uh, challenger data on uh, layoffs, and that's actually took a, a, dr a drop, significant drop over the past couple of months. So uh, and initial claims, of course, uh, we're, we're looking at that very carefully and looking for whether uh, whether an anomalies or whether, in fact, uh, we're, we're having a problem with uh, people losing jobs. Uh, Chip, uh, can you write about the Fed swap desk, uh, Eric? Uh, is that something you is? Would that be part of your uh, autobiography? I wrote mine 
40 years after I started. Maybe they want you to start writing your autobiography sooner. Yeah, I'll write about it if uh, anything happens. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it might be interesting for you one day to just, uh, you know, give us a little bit of a of a spin from your vantage point of what actually happens on the Fed's trading desk. So that yeah, would be tales of uh, trading repo over the phones when it was COVID and no one knew <laughs> how to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must have been fun. Okay, uh, Lucas. Hey guys, I was wondering about the re-entrance part of job reports. Historically, that usually leads to deterioration, but you are very sanguine about it. Any thoughts? Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so re-entrance have been a huge driver of unemployment. Um, on one hand, you know, this does reflect like a cooling of the labor market. There's less job openings. We, we think that that makes sense. On the other hand, um, prime age labor force participation and prime age employment to population, so the employment rate, uh, are at record highs or near record highs. So I think this really reflects, um, A, that workers are encouraged to come back into the labor force, and that B, there's secular trends post-pandemic Work from home has enabled so many people to come into the labor force, including women. Labor force participation among prime age women is skyrocketed. So, um, you know, sure, there's a little bit less job availability as the labor market cools, but by and large, it's just people are encouraged to enter the workforce. Okay, Brenda wants to know, do you think a rolling recession is beginning to impact the travel industry? Um, I don't. I, I personally don't think so. Uh, my wife and I. Is is your puppy there, uh, Eric? He's poking his head out. I'll, I'll bring him up. Okay, good. Uh, I'll I'll cover for you. <sighs> so you know, I, I. What's what's the puppy's name? This is Yo Yo, short for Johansson. Johansson. He cute. looks like a Johansson. <laughs> that's, a, that's a cute one. He's what a good boy. Of, what kind is it? He's a corgi, Pembroke Welsh corgi. Oh, okay. It's, it's like not... five or six months now. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. So back to Brenda's uh, question here. Um, uh, from a personal perspective, my wife and I went to Scotland and, uh, and England uh, in uh, June, and we're scheduled to go to Italy in uh, September. And uh, a lot of our friends, especially those who have retired, are, are traveling at, at least as much. My experience in the airports of late, uh, when I go visit accounts or go on vacations or long weekends, is that they're packed. So no, I, I don't think there's an, a, an issue there. Uh, we will though, however, look at the passenger, uh, you know, the, the TSA has uh, some uh, passenger traffic uh, data. We'll look at it and we'll, if we see anything, we'll let you know. Uh, okay, Addy, uh, given your view that the Fed doesn't need to cut rates anytime soon, what do you think will be the consequences of them cutting three, four times by December as the market is pricing in? So that's uh, that's not our story. Our story is one and done. Uh, we're, we're sticking to it. We stuck with it uh, last week uh, when everybody was getting hysterical about the need. Not everybody, but I, I guess uh, Professor Marty Siegel, he's a friend, uh, was on CNBC saying we need an emergency cut of three three quarters. Um, uh, a percentage point uh, didn't uh, make much sense to us. And by the way, Eric pointed out to me that if uh, the Fed had overreacted and cut interest rates in an emergency basis, I uh, guess what would happen to the yen? <laughs> it would have gotten yeah. stronger, and the carry trades would have just totally bl blown out of uh, out of the water. Uh, so that would have been a, a, a total mistake. But uh, we think the uh, we think the last employment number was uh, weather related was weak on a weather related basis. We think that uh, the the data is going to look better. Uh, we we were encouraged by the last initial claims uh, data. Obviously, retail sales and production are going to be weak uh, for the month of July because the July employment report suggests as much. But again, that could have been weather related. Um, and if the market kind of comes around to our view and some Fed officials might actually push back against a 50 basis point cut uh, in September, uh, maybe the markets will uh, come around to uh, it's not going to be three to four cuts uh, over the rest of this year. Uh, Brian, uh, I think that's a good question go down below from Ed on uh, long-term treasury yields, if you want to feel that. Go, go ahead. Um, so yeah, it's Ed asking, um, you know, long-term treasury yields seem to hold the relationship with growth and inflation expectations. Um, what are we thinking about our, our kind of outlook for the 10-year? It seems like uh, long yields are a little low, he says. Go ahead. Oh, I'll, I'll take it, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, so I think we're, we're kind of targeting 4 to 5% for our range, uh, more often below 4.5, uh, so 4 to 4.5 than not. Um, and what we're plugging into that is 10-year uh, real yield. Which, which dog is that, Ed? That's Max. Max. <laughs> this is the famous Max. That, that's Bailey, which will make her famous too. <laughs> Um, good, old, good, good old Max uh, always, almost always joins us, but I'll, I'll let him off now. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. They're a little better uh, than my puppy. Um, but yeah, no, I think what we're plugging into that is two, two and a quarter on the 10 year tips. So uh, real rates and then two, two and a quarter for long term inflation expectations gets us to that four, four and a half. Um, I think why you have that five top range is because there's just some, there's, there's looming risks, right? We saw Treasury supply concerns last fall uh, bring us to 5%, um, you know, tariffs or uh, geopolitical risks, raising goods prices um, or energy prices could get us up there. But, you know, I think the, you know, we had that big rally um, as the yen was, the yen carry trade was unwinding and the markets were kind of in panic mode. Um, but, you know, we should be crossing back above 4% here pretty, pretty soon. Eric, uh, we, we did it. We, uh, Managed to fill up half an hour, which is what I try to promise people. Uh, this time around, we uh, did it more efficiently. Oh, and uh, Yo-Yo is very excited. Yo-Yo's saying it's time to time for us to stop. But look, everybody, thank you uh, so much uh, for for joining us, uh, and uh, hope we have a good week. It's going to be crazy, full of economic indicators, probably Fed officials, geopolitical uh, thrills and chills, and uh, uh, of course, there's always uh, domestic politics to. Uh, to annoy us all. But um, thanks again. See you next week. Thanks, thanks everyone.